So welcome to the second part of the sepsis lecture. In this part, we're going to be going through the pathophysiology of sepsis. We want to know why it occurs. So I did say to you previously that you could get two patients that are admitted into hospital, both, for example, with community acquired pneumonia. One of the patients will develop sepsis and one won't. And we don't fully understand why this occurs. Some of the factors that could play a role in this include the type of pathogen that's causing the infection. Some are more virulent than others. Also, the number of pathogens that are present and where they are located in the body. And then we consider the individual's factors or the host factors. And this is determined by the patient's genetics as well as any other conditions that predispose them uh, to infections or to this dysregulated host response. So we're going to go through the pathophysiology of sepsis as well as septic shock. We spoke about previously septic shock being a subset of sepsis and a severe form. And we did break down the origin of the word. But I'll break this down again. Septic is a Latin word for rotten. And shock is a term we used that medically means there's a decreased, decreased tissue oxygenation and low blood pressure. And we're going to speak about why both of these, is, these occur. If you combine septic shock together, this means that there's decreased tissue oxygenation caused by something that's rotten. Rotten here means infective material that can then lead to this decreased tissue oxygenation. So... Blood is normally used to deliver oxygen to tissue cells, and they do this by using red blood cells. And red blood cells have the ability to deliver tissue, oxygen to these tissue cells, but once there's infective material in the bloodstream, and this could be in the form of a bacteria, a virus, or a fungi, white blood cells, which are a part of your immune response, start to arrive in that area and start to encounter this infective material. And they realize that this is not supposed to be here. Uh, blood is usually a sterile environment and therefore infected material or unclean rotten material within the blood cells makes this environment no longer a sterile environment. And if you link this back to the word of septic, we said septic is Latin for rotten. And this is where we have this rotten material, this infective material within the blood cells. And white blood cells arrive in the area and they start to, they want to clean that environment and remove this unclean rotten material. And in order to do this, they need backup. So they call for backup. And this is the first step in that response. Um, and therefore we have, the first step is white blood cell recruitment. Now, if the infected material is not in the bloodstream and is in the tissue fluid, which is outside of the blood vessels, which is what is happening in the large majority of the time, um, white blood cells need to move from the blood to the inter interstitial tissue that's surrounding or across the lining of the blood vessels. So here you can see uh, this thick lining of the blood vessels and they need to get across that. The way they do this is they release different molecules one of the molecules that they release is called nitrous oxide, and this interacts with the blood, blood vessels. And once it interacts with the blood vessels, it causes blood vessel dilation. And the term we use for this is vasodilation. In other words, they decrease the diameter of the blood vessel. So if you look at the picture on the left and you look at the picture on the right, this is an example of vasodilation. So we've increased the diameter of the blood vessel. And what this does is it decreases vascular resistance. If you're thinking about all these red, bl red blood cells traveling through your blood vessel, if you're now making that, essentially that road, a larger road, so imagine it being a motorway, you've now created six lanes in this motorway, there's going to be less traffic. So now you've decreased vascular resistance and therefore you've decreased systemic vascular resistance. There's an equation that determines your blood pressure and it's cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance equals blood pressure. 
if you decrease the systemic vascular resistance, you are in turn decreasing blood pressure. And I want you to remember this. So the blood now has more space to move around and it's not bumping into many things as much as it used to because of this increased space. So you've got a decrease in resistance and also a decrease in blood pressure. So this means that your blood starts to slow down. Um, this increase of resistance increases the flow of your, of your blood. So less resistance means that your blood's slowing down and at the same time, white blood cells also need to make your blood vessels leaky in order to improve their permeability to get through uh, the blood vessels. So they do this by using nitrous oxide again. And this leads to this term shock where you've got improve, uh, uh, an increase in permeability of the blood vessels. You've got a decrease in vascular resistance and you're reducing blood pressure. And like we said to you before, um, the term shock means that this decrease tissue oxygenation and low blood pressure. Now, I haven't really spoke about why there's a decrease in tissue oxygenation. Why is it more difficult for oxygen to get into your tissue cells, which are surrounding your blood vessels? And the reason for this is once you've got this leakiness where you've got these holes in the blood vessels, you've now allowed fluid to make its way from the blood vessels into that, that extracellular space. So you now allowed it to get into this space outside of the blood vessels. And this fluid comes in the way from your oxygen coming from your red blood cells into the tissue cells. So this fluid is now getting in the way and it's essentially starving your tissue cells from oxygen. And this leads to tissue cells, with these tissue cells being starved of oxygen, this is the primary cause of shock. Now, white blood cells also want to destroy this infective material. And they do this by releasing reactive oxygen species and these lytic enzymes in order to damage and destroy the pathogen. And what I'm going to stress to you is this is happening everywhere around all the blood vessels in the body. So you're not only damaging the pathogen here, but you're starting to damage the blood vessels too. And this is a widespread response occurring all over the body, and this can lead to serious complications. Now, as blood, blood cells are being damaged, coagulation factors are coming into play now, and they're arriving in the area in order to patch up the damage that's being made by, by, by the white blood cells. So, in order for coagulation to occur, you've also got these coagulation factors and they're proteins that help with clotting. So when blood vessels are ruptured, you, you want to create a clot to patch up that area so that blood doesn't move from the vessel into that extravascular space. Now, like I said to you before, this is happening all around the body and your blood, your coagulation factors are now getting used up and completely you're completely depleting the stores here. So coagulation can't keep up with the breakage of these blood vessels. And now you've got these small blood clots that are continuously trying to be formed and they're breaking off. And you end up in a state where coagulation factors are completely depleted and they can't keep up with the ruptured blood vessels. The name for this state is disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. And it's a very serious complication because your body can no longer keep up uh, with the damage that's occurring and can no longer keep up with the, with the coagulation that's required. Uh, another complication that can be seen in septic shock is acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as ARDS, A-R-D-S. And now we're gonna move to the lungs. So the lungs also have a large amount of blood vessels in their area. And this means there's a lot of blood vessels that are required to take oxygen from the atmosphere and take it towards the heart in order to move that oxygenated blood towards your entire body. So I said to you before, blood vessels are being damaged all over the body. So these lytic enzymes, cytokines, all other sort of immune um, molecules end up damaging blood vessels in the lungs 
and therefore oxygen can't be proper, properly absorbed from the lungs. And this leads to patients uh, moving to a severe septic shock and end up in respiratory distress. So like I said to you before, septic shock means that you've got decreased tissue oxygenation. If you have an inability to, to get oxygen from your lungs and move that oxygen to a, around your body, you've got a massive decrease in in tissue ox tissue perfusion so oxygen making its way to your tissue cells and this leads to respiratory distress again this is a severe complication so the two complications that we've addressed now are disseminated intravascular coagulation as well as acute respiratory distress syndrome and finally uh, we've got an increase in cardiac output. So cardiac output starts to initially increase as a result of your decreased vascular resistance to try and balance that equation. However, as a patient starts experiencing septic shock, the heart starts to become damaged by the immune molecules as well. And if you leave that untreated long enough, cardiac output then begins to decrease as well. And this would further decrease your blood pressure. So... A major symptom of a patient with septic shock is the fact that their skin will be warm. And this is because you've got this widespread vasodilation that's occurring because of nitrous oxide. So the central nervous system is trying to increase blood pressure and cause vasoconstriction. And this is in response to this vasodilation that's occurring throughout the body. If vasoconstriction occurs because of the central nervous system, then your skin starts to become cooler and your blood vessels will start to become less leaky. And this will lead to an increase in your heart rate in order to compensate for this. So this is known as compensatory tachycardia. And the body attempts to compensate for the fact that you've got low blood pressure. So at the same time, your circulating volume is becoming is starting to become depleted. So the amount of blood that you've got circulating uh, back to the body starts to become depleted and the compensatory mechanisms start to get exhausted. Circulation begins to fail at this point and the patient starts to look a lot worse with cool skin. So if a patient has cool skin, this is a sign that they may have prolonged capillary re refill time and this is a sign of possible organ dysfunction. And it's critical to ensure that you identify patients are at this stage and they go move into critical, critical care immediately because it means they're no longer at a state of vasodilation across the entire body, but they're now in a state of vasoconstriction, which is happening to compensate for the initial vasodilation. So they're at a very late stage in the sepsis, uh, sepsis sepsis uh, pathophysiology. So this completes the section on sepsis pathophysiology and in the next section we're going to start to talk about the patient assessment.